us for this week's lecturing planning series presentation. Our opening speaker this fall semester is Professor Michael Mendez, Assistant Professor of Environmental Policy and Planning at the University of California, Irvine. My name is Helena Rong. I'm a PhD student here at Columbia's um, Urban Planning Program, and I'll be moderating the session. Uh, I'll just start with a few brief uh, technical logistical announcements before turning to introduce our speaker. During the talk, I'd like to remind audience members on Zoom to please mute your microphones. We'll be recording today's lecture, so for anyone uh, who wishes to be not recorded, should turn off their camera. Audience in AV114, who are also connected on Zoom, please be mindful to mute your uh, microphone as well. The chat box should be used only for discussion regarding the session. If you have any technical questions that apply only to you, um, please message my co-host Ranjani and Carolyn um, privately. We encourage all of you to type questions into the chat box during the presentation. After the presentation, we'll have time for Q&A. We'll start Q&A at around 2 to 2.15 2 p.m. so that we have enough time for everyone's questions. I'll be coordinating the Q&A with attention to diversity and inclusion. So if you have already had a chance to ask a question, please we'll allow others to do so before asking another one. To ask questions, participants can use the raise your hand feature. Uh, and we will call on you to unmute and ask your question directly. Or you may also type your question in the chat box and I can read them out. And for audience here in AV114, uh, you can just raise your hand and I'll call on you and you can ask directly. So with that, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Michael Mendez is an assistant professor of environmental policy and planning at the University of California, Irvine. He previously was an inaugural James and Mary Pinchot faculty fellow in sustainability studies and associate research scientist at the Yale School of the Environment. Dr. Mendez has more than a decade of senior level experience in the public and private sectors, where he consulted and actively engaged in the policymaking process, including working for the California State Legislature as a senior consultant, lobbyist, and as vice chair of the Sacramento City Planning Commission. In 2021, California Governor Gavin Newsom appointed Dr. Mendez to the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board. The board regulates water quality in a region of 11 million people. During his time at UC Irvine and at Yale, he has contributed to state and national research policy initiatives, including serving as an advisor to the California Air Resources Board member and as a participant of the US Global Change Research Program work, work, work group on climate vulnerability and social science perspectives. Dr. Mendez holds three degrees in environmental planning and policy, including a PhD from UC Berkeley's Department of City and Regional Planning and a graduate degree from MIT. Dr. Mendez's talk today is entitled Climate Change from the Streets, which is the same as the title of his new award-winning book published in 2020. It's an urgent and timely story of the contentious politics of incorporating environmental justice into global climate change policy. I'm sure it'll be an insightful talk on the relationship between public health and environmental protection. So Professor Mendez, if you're ready, I'll pass things over to you now. Uh, thank you, Helena, and uh, good uh, afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure and honor to be here. I believe uh, some of you may have read my book over the summer as uh, incoming master class. And for those that haven't, I hope this is a good highlight about these important issues between the intersection of climate change, public health, and community of color. And particularly, how can we put a racial and equity lens framework um, in the climate change policymaking process? So thank you for this opportunity. Again, it's quite an honor to be invited by uh, Columbia and the Department of uh, Urban Planning and to be part of the summer reading again. So I'm going to begin by sharing my screen, and I'm going to be providing some broad highlights of the book, and then I'm going to delve into one of the, the key chapters that has a local and international environmental justice lens. So to begin with, in places like California, where the majority of my research takes place uh, in, in the international context, uh, in California, we are experiencing a major climate change crisis and a his historic racial unrest. In the last past years, millions of people have been impacted by multiple disasters, fires, blackouts, heat waves, drought, hazardous air quality, and a deep economic recession, and of course, the ever-present uh, COVID-19 pandemic. These are all major life events that are compounding together. These compounding of disasters have cascading health, social, and economic impacts. And due to existing structural inequality, 
these impacts are disproportionately affecting low-income people of color. To address the climate emergency, activists and policymakers have proposed the Green New Deal at the federal level. As many of you know, this is a radical proposal to decarbonize our economy and address poverty and inequality. However, for the last two decades, low-income communities of color have also pushed state and local governments to experiment with reducing greenhouse gas emissions in approaches that also address inequality and public health. These efforts in climate experimentation have been contentious and are often met with significant resistance. While I'm supportive of the Green New Deal, I'm here to say that there is nothing new about the Green New Deal. Climate change experiments in places like California since 2006 have been all out street fights. Environmental justice activists are often pitted against traditional environmentalists who favor the least costly mitigation solutions which do not necessarily maximize equity and public health, public health outcomes in low-income communities of color. These conflicts over climate change are cultural at their core. They illustrate that although the science of climate change is clear, policy decisions about how to respond to its effects remain contentious. Even when such decisions claim to be guided by objective knowledge, they are made and implemented through political institutions and relationships and all the competing interests and power and racial struggles that this implies. So if we look towards the example of California, it reveals the, content, the contingent nature of climate change policy, the assumptions and social, political and cultural attitudes that often create conflict between community understandings of local environmental conditions and the prevailing global top-down conceptualization of climate change. In California, tensions between different approaches to addressing climate change are often centered on the politics of scale, economics, class, and race. These differences and worldviews, if unacknowledged, can lead to the breakdown of trust, even among groups that are normally working towards the same goal, reducing the harm that climate change would do to human societies and our planets. For, for insight into national level conflicts between groups working on climate solutions, one should look towards the nearly two decade California experiment of incorporating environmental justice and health equity principles into climate change policy. For environmental justice activists in California and other places, the main threat from climate change is the disproportionate harm it causes to their bodies, and the health of their communities. For them, climate change is not just about global greenhouse gas models. Rather, it is also about opposing worldviews through which policy and science is seen. Yet California is still often seen as this homogenous entity that uniformly values environmentalism and climate action. This image universalizes the idea of climate change and detaches it from its cultural settings. It also obscures how the localization of environmental policy and science within the state it involves processes of public consultation and legitimacy. For example, the, the traditional environmental narrative um, is really embodied in on this recent book that was published by a major university press. And it describes itself as the definitive book on California's environmental history. And this recently published book is about 300 pages. And an entire book, people of color um, and uh, people of color legislators are only mentioned in passing twice. So the traditional environmental narrative of California and its global leadership um, really facilitates this erasure of people of color and enacting a comprehensive environmental policy and leadership. Therefore, I published my book, Climate Change from the Streets, with the explicit focus on people of color. My book foregrounds people, place, and power in the context of climate change and inequality. This research originated in my public policy work for the California State Legislature during a 15-year period. This provided me valuable insight into how the interactions of governments, businesses, and NGOs shape climate change policy. My research is further influenced by my experience growing up in Latino immigrant communities of Los Angeles that face multiple environmental threats. At the youth in places like Pacoima, Selmar, and Lake Guterres, 
I was surrounded by people resisting environmental racism, whether protesting the siting of landfills or organizing to demand the cleanup of toxic properties. They sought to understand how these situations originated, to develop alternatives, and to imagine new environmental futures. Therefore, this has focused my work on what the conceptualization of environmental justice and climate change has meant to activists, policymakers, experts, and scholars alike. Understanding this is important because the idea of environmental justice has been growing in scope beyond the initial application to the inequitable distribution of hazardous waste dumps in poor communities of color. My work analyzes the expansion of environmental justice policy discourse and the ways in which it has challenged definitions of nature and society. When I began this uh, research project in California, I was struck by the lack of scholarship on the narratives of environmental justice in the context of climate change. This, the literature shows a real neglect of environmental justice groups' worldview and influence in climate change policy arenas. The lack of a narrative perspective is largely due to the fact that since the 1980s, environmental justice studies has sought to legitimize itself as an area of serious academic inquiry. The first generation of environmental justice scholars in general focused on causality and quantifying environmental inequality through the lens of race and class at a single scale. However, an emerging second generation has extended the field to incorporate a deeper consideration of critical theory and intersectionality, the ways in which gender, class, uh, sexuality, immigration status, and other, human, and other human identities shape environmental justice at multiple scales. This second generation has been dubbed critical environmental justice studies, and it focuses on four important questions that are central to my own work. The first question asks, how does intersectionality, multiple forms of difference, race, gender, uh, uh, in class, uh, immigration status, sexuality, influence environmental justice outcomes? The second, to what extent should scholars focus on a single scale or multi-scale uh, multi analysis of the causes and possible resolutions to environmental justice struggle? Third, to what degree do state power and market systems entrench social inequality? And finally, how can marginalized groups whose participation is indispensable to society shape sustain sustainable and collective futures? Therefore, using a critical environmental justice study lens, the key argument in my book is for society to successfully resolve the phenomenon of climate change, critical attention must be placed on the human dimensions of climate change policymaking, such as local knowledge, culture, and history, and it should be done at multiple scales. Central to this art argument is a district, uh, demonstration that environmental protection and improving public health are uniquely linked and maintaining that link is key to advancing future climate action policies. The case of California is particularly productive as to analyze how the human dimensions of cli uh, uh, climate change uh, policy unfold. As the world's fifth largest economy and the only US state to implement a comprehensive program of regulatory and market-based mechanisms to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, California has consistently been at the forefront of broader national and global uh, environmental experimentation. The state's cap and trade program, a central market-based mechanism for sure ensuring carbon uh, emissions reduction is the third largest in the world after the European Union and China. This program has been especially contentious in debates within California. Supporters emphasize its global reach and cost effectiveness and detractors criticize its inequitable effects on specific local communities and demographic groups. California's prominence in climate change policy makes it an ideal place to investigate the dynamics of such disputes and their roots in differing climate change worldviews. My multi-sided uh, ethnographic policy analysis weaves together uh, uh, case studies uh, that are uh, three interconnected case studies. The first looks at climate and public health activism in two heavily impacted communities of color, Richmond and Oakland, California. The second looks at conflict over state level carbon trading and use of its revenue for investment in local communities most harmed by air pollution. And the third 
is uh, looks at international and local implications of forest conservation projects in the global south. In this case, uh, Chiapas, Mexico, and Acta Brazil allowed under California's market-based climate change world uh, climate change laws. And this is a case study that I'll go into depth momentarily. These case studies combine to reveal the contested politics of the local, state, and transnational levels on which California makes climate change policy and takes action. For example, I, I trace activists as they travel between geographies and policy scales. They are not just situated in, in, in one space, but transverse geographies and policy scales. For example, in Richmond, California, which has the single largest um, uh, oil refinery west of the Mississippi, that also happens to be the single largest greenhouse gas emitter in the entire state of California, and one of the largest emitters of local pollution that affects people's health. So activists in that area have been um, fighting to um, close down that oil refinery or change its uh, business practices for their less harmful. So that these activists understand that the Chevron refinery is part of a global system that's not just only locally based. So they, they know they, they can't just protest in City Hall in Richmond, California, but they also have to uh, jump policy scales such um, as uh, uh, Sacramento, California state capital, which defines uh, California's climate change programs. So uh, while they're protesting in Richmond, California, they're also working at the state capital to try to rescale California's global uh, worldview and perspective on its climate change programs to focus back at, on local communities that are hit first and hardest from climate change impacts and local pollution. At the same time, they understand that California is part of a global system. California often sees itself as a nation state uh, operating um, its uh, cap and trade program with other major um, nations in the country. Again, California's cap and trade program is the third largest in the world after the European Union and China. So these activists are also trying to rescale that global uh, perspective, particularly on projects um, that are outsourcing environmental benefits to um, places like Chiapas um, and Acre, Brazil. And these projects are uh, not only contentious in environmental justice communities in California, they're also contentious with many in indigenous and um, leaders in the global south uh, that fear that California's forest conservation projects, carbon sinks that they're, they're creating there, may uh, create dispossession of indigenous lands. And I'll go into that case study momentarily. So the three aims of this multi-scale uh, research are, the first to demonstrate that public health and environmental justice perspectives can be central to successful climate change policy development and implementation. The second is to offer an, an interdis interdisciplinary framework for theorizing the kinds of negotiations between scales and worldviews that are involved in the development of equitable climate change policy. And third, provide a set of findings findings that activists can use to negotiate with governments that legitimizes their perspectives or worldview about the differential impact of climate change on disadvantaged communities. A quick note on uh, my methods as a multi-scalar uh, study, my work draws on two main sources, notes from my years observing policymaking in Sacramento State Capitol, and extensive interviews with climate uh, policymakers and environmental justice stakeholders from 2012 uh, to 2015 with several follow-up interviews conducted in 2017, 2018, and 2019. My uh, participant observer reflections, content analysis, and semi-structured interviews provide valuable information on the conflicts and collaborations defining climate change and environmental justice in California. Now on to the, 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 this international global case study. While some of you may not agree with this following case study, as scholars and activists, it is important to understand the modes, strategies, and logics uh, that strong social movements like environmental justice uh, groups employ. So I ask you to explore this case with an open mind. In this case study from my book, here we will be jumping scales from the local to global. We will see how the conceptualization of environmental justice as an organizing theme has spread horizontally throughout, Cal uh, throughout California and how it's now vertically linked to the global south in Mexico and Brazil. For California advocates, there has been a growing need to develop 
um, a global consciousness in the environmental justice movement. Activists recognize the importance of connecting local agendas with trends they see nationally and internationally around climate change. In this case study, I examined how the continued collaborations, experimentation, and coalition building since 2010 have brought, brought California environmental justice perspectives onto the global stage. This story centers on the ways in which carbon markets can create international links between local injustices and prop new forms of translocal activism. A central uh, figure in this story is Mary Rose Tarouk, an activist with the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, or APEN for short, one of the leading environmental justice groups in California, also based in Richmond, California. Her interesting her indigenous last name in Tagalog means to know. According to Mary Rose, the need to engage on, on a global scale became clear when APEN's Native American allies, who represent sovereign nations, were participating in United Nations debates on climate change policy. Native American advocacy groups like the Indigenous Environmental Network developed campaigns that brought US environmental justice groups to the United Nations and other global spaces. And these arenas, California environmental justice groups learned how linking their local campaigns could also help indigenous communities in the global South. These interactions laid a strong foundation for new translocal efforts when California attempted to link its cap and trade system to Chiapas, Mexico and Acla, Brazil through forest offset credits. Carbon offsets allow California's polluting industries to pay someone else anywhere in the world to reduce their emissions by engaging in activities such as forest conservation. Forest offsets are also known as reducing emissions, fund deforestation and degradation, or RED for short. In other words, RED offsets allow pollution at home only if developing countries keep their forests in the ground and do not use their own natural resources. Polluting industry, uh, industries in the United States are allowed to continue to pollute most often in low-income communities of color like Richmond and Oakland, California. California's traditional environmentalists such as the Environmental Defense Fund, the Nature Conservancy, polluting businesses, and some large indigenous groups. These are large group indigenous groups that have formal land title to their lands and therefore are recognized by their uh, federal and local governments. Support such offset projects because of cost effectiveness, ecological enhancements to tropical forests, and benefit sharing opportunities for indigenous communities. These groups stress the need to combat tropical deforestation, that is the cutting and burning of trees to convert land to grow crops, extract oil, or raise, uh, or raise livestock. It is estimated that such uh, activities account for more than 20% of the Earth's human-caused uh, carbon emissions. Polluting uh, industries support uh, forest offsets in the global south in particular because it is a significantly cheaper option for reducing carbon emissions when compared to US uh, domestic mechanisms. For California environmental justice groups, however, it seemed that red offsets likely would not address local air pollution they, and they foresaw increased emissions in disadvantaged neighborhoods. Smaller indigenous rights groups in Akle and Chiapas, these are smaller groups that don't have land tenure, land title, and are not recognized by their local or, or federal governments, argued that the new value of pristine forest reserves could motivate landowners to evict forest-based indigenous communities, especially in regions like Chiapas, Mexico, where there has been a long history of violent conflict over land rights. To them, red could exasperate local environmental problems and perpetuate historic injustices. Thus, in response, a new translocal coalition emerged between South and North social movements. Uh, here again, we see how notions of environmental justice travel and are horizontally and vertically linked. This translocal coalition moreover argues for a systems th uh, thinking or feedback loop, loop appro approach to climate change policy. For example, they claim US imports of crude oil from the Amazon are driving the destruction of some of the for, uh, rainforest ecosystems most pristine areas and releasing large amounts of uh, greenhouse gases. According to an Amazon watch study, American refineries processed over 230,000 barrels of Amazon crude oil a day. And California represents a large majority. <clears throat> 
an average of 171,000 barrels, comprising 74% of all Amazon crude imports to the US. And also uh, activists re uh, really argue that the processing of uh, crude oil has these embodied environmental and health impacts at the local level, uh, creating injustices in the Amazon as well in places like Richmond, California. Just earlier this year, the processing of crude oil um, in, uh, the Chevron re refinery in Richmond spilled over 600, uh, ga uh, 600 uh, gallons of crude oil into the San Francisco Bay, as we see in the picture on the left. And the Chevron refinery has had multiple uh, fires that uh, created ma mandatory evacuation zones that sent 15,000 people to hospital emergency rooms, for example, and uh, August 6, 2012. Moreover, for a, a people like Mary Rose, a hostile incident solidified her determination uh, against red offsets and towards a system thinking approach to climate change policy. At a 2010 United Nations uh, uh, meeting in Cancun, Mexico, she was detained and tossed out of the climate negotiations for holding a sign opposing carbon markets. Uh, she told me, Quote, you would think I would be afraid after that experience, but actually I was encouraged because to the right of me at the protest was the president of Bolivia, Evo Morales, and to the left of me were leaders of social movements from the Western Hemisphere, from the MST of Brazil, and the Via Campesina of Mexico. And in front of me were the Native American brothers and sisters from the Indigenous, Indigenous Environmental Network who have been campaigning to aid red, uh, red forest offsets, end quote. So working together in person and via conference calls during 2011 and 2012, California environmental justice groups and indigenous uh, rights groups organized an opposition campaign. Through this process, they were able to overcome concerns from groups from Mexico and Brazil that California environmental justice groups might sell them out through carbon market trading and revenue sharing programs. After several uh, collaborative negotiations, they eventually forged a common understanding about the spatial implications and global reach of California's carbon market, highlighting potential harms to those living among the trees and those living next to polluting industries. The debate, again, the, the, this debate is so contentious because California is the third largest carbon market in the world. The implication here, California is a global climate leader, and if California adopts uh, red offsets, others will follow globally. While policymakers in California proclaim the benefits of forest offsets at international events, several indigenous uh, groups from the global south protest the lack of consultation during the development of a proposal that could impact their lands and livelihoods. The first major global protest against California's carbon market occurred on September 26, 2012 where over 40 indigenous protesters from the Lancon jungle and members of international NGOs gathered outside the governor's climate and forest task force meeting in Chiapas, Mexico. The task force founded by the state of California brought together governments, the government and business officials dedicated to implementing uh, red offsets globally. They represented 16 local governments of six countries, Mexico, Brazil, and Indonesia, the United States, Peru, and Nigeria, that uh, between them held 20% of the world's forest. Among the most uh, vocal protesters at the task force meeting was Ufima Sanchez, a Mayan indigenous leader from the remote jungles of Chiapas. Denied a chance to address the meeting, Sanchez seized the microphone phone during the open uh, plenary and spoke before a packed auditorium of several hundred participants. Quote, she was quoted as saying, we have come before you today to denounce the programs and projects that threaten to dispossess us of our territories. Why do the wealthy want to impose their will by force? The jungles are sacred and exist to serve the people. We don't come to your countries and tell you what to do with your lands and livelihoods. We ask for the same respect, end quote. Ufima's uh, rejection of uh, forest offices invoked the nature of the forest as a home, a historically contested territory and a sacred space. Her intervention highlights how climate change policy maps onto existing cultural meanings and social and historic dynamics concerning property, politics, and culture. For example, at this one of uh, this protest on several indigenous leaders held up signs, the one at the bottom right reads, 
The government of Chiapas had lied to us. They didn't inform us, they didn't consult us, and we don't want red offsets. So under international uh, law and policies, before you enter into any uh, 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 multilateral or bilateral agreement that'll impact um, lands and livelihoods of indigenous, indigenous communities, there has to be free, prior, and informed consent. And the allegation here is that that was violated and that didn't occur. Three weeks after the Forest Task Force meeting in Chiapas, an international delegation of indigenous leaders from Brazil, Mexico, and Ecuador traveled to Sacramento, California to represent uh, to register their opposition in person at the California Air Resources Board public hearing on October 18, 2012. The delegation was hosted by Friends of the Earth and several California environmental justice organizations. While digital communication aided the development of a South-North exchange, activists understood that physical sites of assembly were still the most effective way of collecting uh, collectively expressing resistance and challenging the dominant power. California represented the locus of power as it is the only local jurisdiction in the world considering red offset programs. The presence of indigenous leaders alongside California environmental justice advocates, moreover, showcased a narrative of the potential South-North uh, environmental injustice derived uh, from California's global market-based climate change solutions. In other words, it was a symbolic reminder of the spatial and human scale impacts of carbon markets. Um, several indigenous uh, advocates and public health advocates spoke out in opposition at the Air Resources Board uh, meeting in Sacramento. For example, one public health act, uh, activist that worked with indigenous communities in uh, the remote jungles of Chiapas presented this brochure that the, uh, that the state of Chiapas uh, distributed at the 2000 uh, Conference of the Parties of the United Nations in Cancun, Mexico. And this brochure, as you can see, highlights that um, it um, cleared 172 illegal groups were relocated in efforts to avoid uh, deforestation. So the, the advocate made the allegation or assertion here that while California has not uh, officially linked its uh, carbon market, its cap and trade system to Chiapas, Mexico, the state of uh, Chiapas, uh, in anticipation of that potential linkage, is clearing out um, indigenous groups that don't have land tenure to create these carbon markets and potential revenue for state and landowners. There was also indigenous leaders from Ocala, Brazil, speaking out in opposition. Ninoa, the president of the Federation of CUNY-Q People, spoke out in opposition, and he was quoted as saying at the hearing, quote, indigenous people are feeling the effects of offset programs. Uh, they are re restricting our way of life and our ability to access to our to have access to our traditional hunting, fishing, and gathering sites. So for this reason, we are urging you not to accept red offsets in your trading program, end quote. California environmental justice advocates also spoke out in opposition. Uh, one group was quoted as saying, quote, we stand with our international brothers and sisters. We believe red programs are bad for communities internationally that are being decimated from the program and California communities that are not receiving the benefit of local pollution reduction, end quote. When uh, the board hearing concluded, members of the Translocal Coalition continued their lobbying efforts at the state capitol. They met with legislative leaders and presented them with a letter signed by more than 30 California-based organizations opposing red. Following the Capitol Lobby Day, the coalition organized a no red tour throughout Northern California. Coalition members sought to educate the public about the effects of offset programs on people living in both industrialized and forest regions. The tour led to a larger policy discussion in the Capitol and news media over California's ability to monitor the integrity of international offsets in developing countries. For example, the legal scholar Alan Romo noted that any international offset program implemented in a development, de developing country would depend on the host country or third parties for verification. Corruption at any stage, including initial reporting, verification, and monitoring could undermine offset programs. We're almost comments influenced by the visibility of the Translocal Coalition further raised concern with capital staff members. This included where this, whether the state could monitor international offsets in the same manner as domestic ones. The state, unlike the federal government, lacks international authority to enforce provisions or intervene in another country's sovereignty. 
Several uh, senior capital and staff members told me that California should be cautious developing linkages where doing so could induce or exasperate human rights violations in the global south. There's other concerns and major challenges of implementing carbon offsets uh, programs. Um, and under, uh, really understanding can forest preserve uh, carbon that sinks for at least 100 years, which is the IPPC rule for uh, forest offsets. There's several major challenges, including um, a wildfires increasing in severity and frequency. As you know, uh, in California, in Brazil, Australia, um, the intensity and severity and frequency of wildfires is, is increasing. We currently have six major active fires, four which are currently burning, are the uh, four largest in California's history that are occurring currently now. And there was a recent study uh, by UC Berkeley that showed that carbon offset burning is undermining the program. The, the Air Board uh, has this 20% uh, buffer um, to account for wildfires um, that are taking over some of these forest conservation projects. Um, and this study is, uh, is, is, uh, is showing and is finding that that 20% buffer is being decimated by the current and uh, past fires. Also, the issue of drug cartels and political corruption. There was an uh, uh, interesting, um, a very informative investigative reporting by the Los Angeles Times that showed that uh, forest reserves are being taken over by drug cartels, uh, not to grow drugs, but also uh, but, uh, to grow avocados because that's a higher commodity. And one uh, ecologist who was uh, taking care of those forest preserves quoted as saying, quote, the worst case scenario is that they decide on making too much noise and they kill me, end quote. He was one of the whistleblowers on um, telling the world about, uh, uh, about the, this uh, situation. And then finally, economic and political uncertainty in many co countries. For example, many of you know that the president of Brazil is, uh, it, it, it can be uh, identified as a climate denier, is not supportive of climate change programs. Um, and really undermine some. And for example, in the fires that happened um, uh, two years ago, the president um, blamed actor Leo, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio for paying uh, people to uh, start these fires. Moreover, at a red panel that I hosted in 2006 at the Yale School of Forestry, the California Air Resources Board member, Dean Flores, commented that regulators are walking a fine line balancing in-state political pressures with a goal of combating global uh, climate change. He said, are we trying to save California or are we trying to save the world? In some sense, the answer may be both. Flores identified forest offsets as one of the most controversial issues facing the Air Board. He added the that the Translocal Coalition has done a good job in highlighting the alleged negative aspects of uh, uh, offsets which made it more difficult to quickly approve the program. Throughout 2012, California environmental justice advocates and indigenous um, leaders demonstrated how powerful network coalitions could shape environmental narratives of carbon reductions. During the next five years, the Translocal Coalition helped stall momentum towards adoption of an international forest offset program. Most importantly, its protests created market and political uncertainty. Today, the issue continues to be contentious and unresolved in, Cal in Sacramento. This form of translocal activism is consistent with Margaret Keck and Catherine Shishink's research on global human rights activism. What the authors term the boomerang pattern can be observed in the ways that NGOs in the global south work with similar domestic groups in the global north. In the case of translocal opposition to red, indigenous groups in Chiapas and Ocular, Brazil protested their, their own government, state A, as we see in the diagram, to stop the development of offset programs. However, due to the relative weakness of civil society in Mexico and Brazil, meant that the groups lack sufficient power to influence their governments and, to, and can even become targets of repression themselves, a situation diagram as blockage in the pattern. The groups therefore connected with California organizations for help. The Global North organizations in comparison had greater freedom of action and benefited from stronger civil societies. Information sharing and collaboration between regions led California environmental justice groups to protest their government, State B, to block the program. Therefore, under the boomerang model, California policymakers perhaps not wanting to be viewed as adopting policies that could provoke human rights abuses abroad 
began to slow down the process of approval of global offsets. Again, this issue has remained contentious and debated in Sacramento and unresolved. Therefore, through their efforts, anti-red activists are challenging the worldviews that are considered valid within California's decision-making on climate change. The Translocal Coalition posed a fundamental question. Who has the power to protect nature and humanity from the existential threat of climate change? The answer has emerged through various forms of conflict and collaboration. California's climate change policy increasingly depends on the ways in which it incorporates marginalized voices from within the state and around the globe. So to sum up some of the key findings from um, this tr uh, trans uh, local anti-red coalition, the first is that distinct groups formed an anti-red campaign based on diverse worldviews and histories. Uh, environmental injustice is interconnected. Environmental justice groups uh, travel across geographies and scales to uh, effectively address them. And more importantly, there's, there are spatial implications of carbon markets. The third finding is that the coalition challenged state power in the North and the South rejecting global structures that embedded environmental injustices within uh, state sanctioned climate change solutions. And then finally, instead of only market-based climate solutions, environmental justice groups are arguing for more equitable alternatives. However, there's a lot of limitations and challenges to this form of translocal activism. The first is there are, there's unequal power dynamics between global North and global South activists, as I previously mentioned. There's divergent perspectives and uh, priorities among Global South Indigenous groups, US and Native American tribes, and California environmental justice groups. As I mentioned earlier, not all Indigenous groups in the Global South oppose carbon offsets or red. These larger groups that have more political power, uh, they have land tenure, so they can no negotiate their state and local governments, um, are, are in strong support of these projects. Also, some of um, uh, Native American tribes in the United States are supportive. For example, the California York, York tribe, which is the largest tribe in California, is also happens to be the largest tribe of forest offices on their own territories within California. And they're, they're linking up with some of these indigenous groups uh, around the globe with the help of the Ford Foundation to try to strategize of how, can, how, how they can help implement red projects globally. A third is that the state, uh, that the state and market forces might co-opt the movement. They essentially may create astroturf or greenwashing and slap on a couple of equity principles without really uh, 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 addressing the structural challenges and inequities in these programs. And then finally, red is an unresolved issue, as I mentioned. There's a lot of difficulty sustaining translocal coalitions over time. It takes a lot of resources, staff time, money, and effort to. Uh, convene these type of um, coalitions. So what does this all really mean? Uh, so what are the larger, broader uh, the, uh, theoretical findings um, of this uh, research? Well, through my more than 10 years of research, I came to see this tension between worldviews of climate change, those of scientists, mainstream environmental groups and policymakers, and then those of environmental justice advocates. While these worldviews are not absolute, they are a generalization of the dynamics I initially observed in California, within California. In the first worldview, I generally saw one based on utilitarianism, efforts to develop climate change policy for the greatest good, for the greatest number. I call this worldview carbon reductionism, an adherence to cost effectiveness and market-based solutions focused only on reducing global greenhouse gas emissions, without social equity, justice, and local health considerations for the most polluted and disadvantaged communities. Under this worldview, my research generally observed governments being judged whether their policies are cost-effective and benefit the majority. So in the initial years under carbon uh, reductionism, there was a strong emphasis just on global re uh, greenhouse gas reduction uh, potential. Uh, and this was also often measured in tons of CO2 equivalent, because carbon is the most abundant greenhouse gas emission in the atmosphere. And there's this strong scientific framing around climate change, very detached expertise of who can frame the idea of uh, climate change as a problem and define the idea of climate change and its data gathering methods and the corresponding solutions. And these solutions are often focused on cost effectiveness. How can we reduce uh, greenhouse uh, 
uh, gases most cost effectively without having a major burden on businesses. This, and this is often achieved through what's called market-based uh, solutions, such as the cap and trade system that I'm, or carbon offsets that I mentioned earlier. And again, California has the third largest cap and trade system after the European Union and China. And this cap and trade system is often seen as being geographically neutral. So since carbon emissions are global in nature, uh, they mix uniformly in the global atmosphere, don't settle at the local level. It doesn't matter where you reduce carbon emissions so long as you reach that global target. So you can do all your emissions reductions in a wealthy community like uh, Beverly Hills or Santa Monica or uh, Manhattan, or you can do them in uh, environmental justice communities like Compton, South Los Angeles, or North Long Beach. And, and the geographically neutral approach to, to cap and trade and carbon programs um, uh, in the early years only had an emphasis on mitigation, just reducing and mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. And in the early years, they did not focus on climate adaptation, acknowledging that wildfires, heat waves, um, extreme weather events are already happening. And we have to adapt our, our, our communities and our society, particularly our most uh, vulnerable communities. So conversely, on the other side, environmental justice groups generally had a moral rights-based worldview. I dubbed their worldview as climate change from the streets, a critical reevaluation of both the practice and politics of reducing carbon emissions. Uh, their worldview considers social equity and argues that a utilitarianism approach ignores distinctions between people and the disproportionate impact of climate change on low-income communities of color. My research observed the environmental justice worldview as participatory, embodied, and experimental. So under a climate change from the streets worldview on the right hand side, there's a strong emphasis not only on greenhouse gas emissions uh, potential, but co benefits potential, understanding that the processes of burning fossil fuels, which causes greenhouse gas emissions, also burn, uh, creates um, other local pollution, like NOx and SOx, uh, that are, are co pollutants that happen at the same time of burning fossil fuel that stay at the local level and do affect people's health. But generally, in our climate change policy, we create these policies, uh, uh, policy silos between global pollution and local pollution. Here, their av advocate, activists advocate for um, a more systems taking approach, a more interlinking of our client and climate change policies that are holistic, that ad uh, address multiple pollutants, uh, people's public health, and greenhouse gas emissions. So there's this strong contextual framing. Uh, understanding that climate change is happening um, in larger society, affecting uh, uh, differently uh, different communities and demographic groups. So there's a, a contextual framing, uh, local expertise is acknowledged to bring into the conversation of defining climate change, data gathering, and uh, uh, policy, policy uh, formulation. So there's an emphasis not just on cost effectiveness, it focuses on cost effectiveness, of course, but it should not happen at the expense of social equity, justice, or other forms of um, equitable outcomes. So focusing on cost effectiveness, but also environmental justice. And these, these solutions are generally community-based solutions, ensuring that um, the solutions are um, not just only benefiting the majority, but the communities that are hit first and worst by the impacts of climate change. So there's a multi-scalar uh, um, approach to this type of uh, cli uh, climate policy, acknowledging that geography, context, and place matters in carbon markets and uh, climate change programs. And then finally, there's an emphasis not just on mitigation. In 2008 and 2009, environmental justice groups really pushed the state and local governments, such as uh, the city of Oakland, but uh, largely the state, to focus on not just uh, uh, st state scale um, adaptation policies and hard assets safeguarding um, our, um, our freeways, hospitals, and schools from the impacts of climate change, but also safeguarding uh, our neighborhoods. So having a local focus on uh, neighborhood adaptation. So environmental justice groups in 2008 really pushed uh, the state and local governments to focus on that. So many of you may consider these worldviews as a simple dichotomy. However, its use is intended to highlight a critical analysis of a contentious politics of scale, economics, and race, and it helps us as scholars understand that the actors involved in climate change policymaking are often speaking from structural locations that are worlds apart. 
And in 2012, yet I witnessed a big change in climate change policymaking. It became more participatory and synergetic. Through a reoccurring process of conflict and collaboration, a broad range of individuals and organizations are now, now co-producing what climate change means. Geog human geographer uh, Mike Hume argues that the tension between worldviews world views can have a balancing, uh, even created impact, yielding stronger, more robust approaches to resolving climate change. Furthermore, worldviews are not fixed, uh, fixed. They can transform over time. Scientific ideas and beliefs about climate change evolve together with the representations, identities, debates, and institutions that give practical effect and meaning to policies. In other words, the ways in which we conceptualize climate change just don't happen. People are behind our governments, policies, and environmental values, and they can change their minds. For instance, at a 2017 United Nations Climate Change Conference, the former California governor, uh, Republican Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger made statements that some traditional environmentalists ascribe to the wrong climate change worldview. He insisted that climate action should now focus more on local air pollutants and their health effects. Schwarzenegger's 2017 position, however, directly contrasted with his worldview when he held public office. As California governor, he often impeded efforts to link climate change policy with environmental justice and public health. His changing perspective reflects the broader evolution of California's worldviews of climate change. Through such instances, we can assess the diversification of climate change and politics, tracing how scientific facts about the world are fused with, with social commitments. So to close up, I attribute this co-productionist uh, framework uh, as being underscored by narratives of embodiment. And environmental justice groups are pushing new hypotheses as well as evaluating existing ones around climate problems and solutions. They are calling for multiple ways of learning and knowing about climate change. Through my many years of interviews, I observed how environmental justice groups centered their work on telling stories how, how their bodies bear the marks of environmental interactions. They framed their work on the human embodiment of climate change and carbon's associated co-pollutants. For them, the body is where diverse points of solution, uh, pollution, social stratification, and poverty intersect. I call this way of knowing and learning as, as climate embodiment. A concept that draws on ecofeminist studies um, and the field of uh, public health. For example, environmental justice advocates in Richmond argue for a holistic understanding of leaks between the infrastructural body, that is the extraction of raw materials for the construction of buildings or the refining of oil to the contaminated human body. In other words, we began to imagine a form of climate embodiment that, that represents a continuum where the human body cannot be divorced from its environment and environmental solutions cannot be isolated from the human body. In conclusion, this embodied research represents new models of engagement with climate change that makes space for alternative paradigms of environmental protection. My engagement with a key stakeholder since 2006 has allowed me to critically analyze how the success of climate change policy in California now depends on incorporating marginalized voices and embody perspectives from the local and global scales. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, it was such a pleasure and I look forward to our conversation uh, in the Q&A, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mendes, for your talk. Uh, I would now like to open up the session for questions. Uh, so just as a reminder again to ask questions, participants on Zoom are encouraged to use the raise your hand button. Uh, and I will call on you to unmute and ask your question directly. Or you can also type in uh, the chat box your question and I can read them out. And for everyone here in every 114, uh, you can also raise your hand and I'll just call on you and you can ask your questions. Uh, so we have a question from Ranjani. Um, is there an equal push for policies that are geared towards reducing the per capita consumption of natural resources by Californians or is, there is for red in California? 
That's an excellent question. So that goes to the sort of systems thinking approach uh, to climate change policy, particularly around forests uh, that environmental justice groups uh, have. Uh, Friends of the Earth, is, which is a, um, a, a big NGO, environmental NGO that works um, in the global south around forests um, and other natural resources, along with a couple of environmental justice groups, uh, about two years ago into entered um, legislation dealing with forest products uh, from uh, the Amazon and, and trying to reduce the consumption of, uh, of California use of such products. Of course, that bill did not uh, really move forward. I think it might have gotten out of one policy committee, but then it was stalled eventually and defeated by various um, uh, industries um, that obviously are benefiting from Amazon uh, forest products. So yes, uh, there's really that, uh, um, push to look at uh, a more of a global systems thinking approach to the California's footprint and um, contributing to uh, global greenhouse gases, both within the state and in this case in um, the Amazon um, through uh, the the buying and use of uh, forest based product pro product from there, but also really acknowledging that uh, our fossil fuel thinking, uh, even at the larger scale, also important to understand that it's a fossil fuel based economy. Um, that it's not just about these type of uh, lumber products, but it's all the products that are derived from um, uh, fossil fuel um, use as well. So really thinking about it's going to take a fundamental shift in our economy um, in, uh, in all sectors um, to really achieve a, a net zero or a more equitable approach to uh, climate change policy to really address the root causes of greenhouse gas emissions and other co-pollutants that affect people's lives and communities. Um, Stefan? Okay, can, can you hear me, Professor Mendez? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm curious about the stability of the political coalition, the kind of utilitarian market-based environmental political coalition as we approach uh, contentious issues that are either interregional in scale, so like the Colorado River watershed or something, um, or uh, invariably engage the nation state. And um, I guess I'm curious about the power of, of actors, whether it's Chevron or farmers in the Central Valley, right? The, the, the many actors, both within California and beyond, for whom any uh, you know, climate change or carbon framework is, uh, is a concern. And I, I guess I'm curious about where EJ and then this kind of utilitarian market environmental coalition uh, land on that. With, with the ultimate concern being, of course, that the, the divisions within uh, these two groups on the kind of liberal left might ultimately uh, prevent uh, climate reduction, you know, strategies overall. And then I guess a, a, a follow-up question to that is whether you think the red framework as it's currently envisioned is doing more harm than good, uh, you know, kind of in its current form. Uh, two excellent questions. A lot there, but two excellent questions. I'll try to answer it as best I can. Um, a subtitle of my book is How Conflict and Collaboration Strengthen the Environmental Justice Movement. So regulators in California or regulators in uh, North Carolina, no matter what, don't uh, environmental regulators, that is, don't just wake up one day and like, I'm going to implement environmental justice. Um, I'm going to have an equity lens friend, uh, frame. So you, you really, we really need to understand who are people, uh, people from the policymakers to the rank and file regulators to appointees, governor and uh, presidential appointees that are in these powerful positions often do not look like uh, individuals that are uh, from these environmental justice communities, the most impacted, most disadvantaged communities. So again, that worldview is, is quite different. And that's why I really emphasize um, in this book and this presentation that there's struck individuals and stakeholders are coming from structural locations that are worlds apart. So to go back to your question is again, regulators don't wake up one day wanting to do that. Oftentimes they resist this, don't want to do this, um, have a very technical scientific framing and see equity, health, sort of outside the purview or scope of the work that they need to do. And, and as you mentioned er, uh, earlier, they do have that utilitarianism approach that what they're doing um, benefits the larger society and therefore encompasses environmental justice. So the 
the conflict and collaboration in my subtitle um, is really at the heart of that, that um, it takes uh, social movements to protest, to have uh, act, oftentimes act antagonistic tactics to force policymakers, rank and file uh, regulators to change uh, their practices and behaviors, because there's definitely oftentimes a regulatory culture within regulatory agencies. And uh, there's a legislative culture as well within legislative bodies um, that bracket out these equity and, um, and um, inclusion uh, dimensions. So oftentimes it takes lawsuits, it takes um, protesting, um, it takes um, finding allies within the legislature, which is a big theme in my book in chapter three, if you read it, on the changing um, demographics of the California legislature where um, retiring uh, white coastal Democrats, mostly men, um, started to retire or, or either get uh, voted out of office because of the changing dynamics from African Americans, uh, uh, the API community, and of course the Latino community. So uh, these groups started teaming up with uh, uh, Latino legislators in particular that um, share, uh, understood these communities oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes understood these communities and uh, sponsored legislation to change those cultural aspects. My little dog there saying sorry. Uh, the cultural aspects of these issues. And essentially the Latino caucus in particular, one of the largest, uh, I think it, it is the largest caucus in the California legislature, started withholding their votes on major environmental bills, climate change bills. So again, California is always the innovator, the experimenter leading the force. So anytime California over the last 15 years wanted to do that, the Latino caucus started withholding votes and saying that is not addressing the heart of environmental justice, our community. And they started incorporating that a little bit more. And that's sort of the conflict and collaboration I, I discussed in the book. And of course, California is not perfect. There's still a lot of environmental injustices, environmental racism. But in the last uh, 15, 17 years, there has been major progress. And California is not only a global leader on climate change, it is a global leader on climate justice, though still more needs to be done and uh, the, uh, the, the state can always do better. The second part of your question about red offsets, they're still being questionable. Uh, there have been three major investigative reporting. And this year alone, uh, one from the MIT Technology Review, which is one of your, uh, your, your um, peer or uh, planning groups, uh, the, the MIT uh, Technology Review Magazine that many of you may read, um, did an investigative reporting with, uh, I think, two academics that really showed uh, the nature conservancies in partic particular and a couple other uh, voluntary offset programs of how uh, they weren't valid oftentimes. And uh, they did verification and really showing that they weren't uh, adding any additionality that there's been cases where um, there have been conservation projects that an NGO uh, uh, um, conserved and dedicated to uh, the preservation uh, from the 1970s to 1980s, and they were double dipping, saying that, that that project that they got in the 70s or 80s is now a forest offset. So forest offset to be valid, you have to show that that, that land, that forest would have been threatened by development, oil extraction, or um, any type of uh, development news. And it has to be immediate. It couldn't be from the 70s or 80s. So that was an MIT technology review. Also look at Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg News, which again, uh, this is a business uh, 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 pub uh, news publication. Also did a very critical uh, analysis of offset. And just earlier, I think it was last week, the Los Angeles Times did a follow-up. Um, investigative reporting on the Nature Conservancy and citing uh, UC Berkeley and, a, and I believe it's uh, Carbon Pulse or Carbon Plan, um, their recent analysis of offsets. So I, I, I encourage you to look at those three independent sources to make your um, own um, judgment of, of offset programs yourself. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a question from the Zoom chat. Um, this is from Rejoice. And the question is, are there some local community solutions to climate change, especially from the anti-red groups? Can you repeat that again? Um, are there some local community solutions to climate change, especially from the anti-red groups? Yeah, so their idea is again securing land tenure, particularly for the smaller indigenous groups or forest people that have been there. We see this in the United States. Some, some uh, indigenous tribes here, particularly in California, are not recognized by the federal government. Luckily, some, they're recognized by the state government, but the federal government does not want to recognize them. That's, that's one of the, the, the main issues, not 
trying to do a program in places like Chiapas that are have a long history of land tenure, long uh, conflict. If you don't know about this, look up uh, the Zapatista Rebellion. Um, that'll give you an idea of how contentious, how violent some of these places are. And I don't know how California decided to, do, uh, to use that at first uh, as one of their pilot areas to look at, but really uh, acknowledging the history and the conflicts that exist. Um, providing opportunities for people to, again, own their land and, and be able to um, conserve the land, but also to, to still maintain their livelihoods. And looking at other types of climate change solutions that tackle um, uh, both global and local pollution, black carbon um, is, is a major issue, particularly in Latin America, um, from the heavy duty trucks. Okay, so black carbon is what they call um, uh, short lived or, or what is what did they just it should be called short lived climate pollutant, but they changed it to I can't remember high powered I can't remember what it's called, but essentially it has uh, seven to sometimes 20 times the global warming potential of just regular carbon. And this comes from the burning of fossil fuels. So it creates uh, a, a global uh, pollutant as well as local pollutant uh, that affects people's health. So black carbon is sort of that very, very fine suit you see everywhere, but it's even finer than that. That comes from uh, the burning of diesel fuel. So looking at how can we convert our, um, our transportation infrastructure to be, uh, have less impact on our environment and of course people's health. So that's a big issue uh, um, I, I think would uh, be better to focus on both in here in the United States um, that have multi-benefit policies uh, addressing co-pollutants. Oh, here we have a question. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, first of all, I love your book. Thank you so much. I. Um, went to undergrad for, I did my undergrad in environmental policy, and I was surprised that I never heard, even though I was taught about um, carbon offsets and cap and trade and everything, I never heard about the spatial and human implications of these solutions. Sorry. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for reading the book. I'll go back. <laughs> Is he there? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry. So I was just like shocked, really. I, I really uh, enjoyed learning about that. So my question is like, um, very often opportunities to access a higher quality um, residential environment, so to live in a better community or, or yeah, with better conditions, I would say, uh, depends on income. So how would inclusion of the streets or of these perspectives from the street, streets or the knowledge from the streets in the development of climate solutions could change or affect how the capitalist system works. So like the cheapest areas to leave will be the ones who, who that are next to the polluting facilities. Like how, how is that gonna be changed? Uh, it's gonna it's gonna take a lot. We see we see things are uh, we see we see these conflicts, these cleavages, these tensions, these fights um, uh, within California. Um, nationally and internationally, uh, the, IP, uh, the uh, IPPC report came out last month, um, and then the UN Climate uh, Change Conference will be in, in Glasgow, Scotland in early November. I'm going to be attending for my first time, so I'm really excited. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's going to take a fundamental shift in how we live. So I often say that, yes, there are very hardcore climate denial, deniers, they do exist, but a lot of people that are, can be classified in that um, uh, climate denier uh, uh, section, like particularly policymakers and industry leaders um, and business owners, um, you know, privately, they, 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 they don't oftentimes don't deny that climate change is happening. We're all experiencing it, but they often are opposing climate change because many people are benefiting from the fossil fuel economy. Many people are becoming very wealthy and, you know, the very um, are extracting a lot of resources from our planet that is supporting their lifestyles from the most, the 1% to um, suburban uh, communities. So we're asking people to fundamentally change that lifestyle, those benefits, those advantages that they have. So going from the fossil fuel economy may, um, essentially is asking for a redistribution of resources, work, types of jobs, and benefits that people are having. So that's gonna be a continuing conflict that we have uh, even within California, because people, 
we're, yes, we're, uh, the state is a very uh, climate leader, but again, um, Cal environmental policy doesn't just happen within California. Um, depending on which uh, list you look, California is the fourth or fifth largest um, oil producer in, in the United States. So the oil industry, uh, the Western, Western States Petroleum Association, which is very powerful, gives a lot of money and lobbying and, and political contributions uh, to various uh, legislators, doesn't, as well as the natural gas industry, uh, the, the building industry, they don't just roll over and let all these quote unquote progressive policies happen. There's a lot of fights that happen, particularly as that's why, as we, we see with environmental justice, environmental justice changes um, our societal practices as well as our business practices. So I think the more honest we could be about that, the better we can moving forward. Um, it's sort of the immediate things that you're asking for is uh, local, for, particularly for local governments, is taking the time and effort to build relationships with NGOs, environmental justice communities, uh, disadvantaged communities, understanding where these communities are, mapping them, building relationships, and uh, having some of these trusted organizations work hand in hand with local governments, providing them resources to do the outreach, and building this uh, and building policy that um, really works with the speed of trust. And a lot of times, governments want to be policy innovators and just get a report or policy done or adopted without doing the work and building that uh, speed of, uh, you know, working and building that, that, uh, that trust with the speed, uh, with the idea of trust. So that, I think that's one area and a lot of governments don't do it from climate change to sustainability issues to my new research, which I wanna share right now um, on uh, uh, climate induced disasters. So I'm really, uh, th this article, I encourage some of you, to, uh, everyone to read this. Uh, looks at the invisible, the invisible uh, victims of disaster, understanding of the vulnerability of undocumented Latino and indigenous migrants, particularly focusing on farm workers that are asked to risk their lives and livelihood through these extreme wildfire events. Again, four of the largest wildfires that ever uh, happened in California's uh, history by acreage are currently burning. And each year, for the last four years, we're breaking that that uh, record. So there's a new fire that beat out uh, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, and now 2021. So essentially, a lot of these air, a lot of these um, fires, extreme wildfire events. These are very com complex fires, multiple fires coming together. They're they're called extreme because they don't follow traditional fire science practices or behavior. And uh, people, uh, farm workers in particular, and winery areas like Sonoma and Napa, the Central Coast, Santa Barbara, are asked to go into mandatory evacuation zones that are considered hazardous for the rest of uh, the, the general population and not given proper N95 masks, goggles, or anything, um, particularly in 2017 when this article takes place, um, and asked to uh, uh, safeguard uh, the crops from smoke and ash without really looking at that human embodiment of what is happening to the, these farm workers, part, particularly ones that are undocumented and indigenous and Latino, what is happening to their bodies from safeguarding harvest, who is safeguarding their bodies. And so my research is really looking at that and we're having, I, I co-author this with community groups and we've had a, a great um, opportunity to um, engage with uh, high level policymakers, both at the local state and international levels, including the United Nations. And I'm continuing this project through an NSF, uh, National Science Foundation study, uh, looking at another region in California and Sonoma County, which is, has some of the most expensive uh, wineries and bottled wines, um, and how that area has experienced multiple years of extreme wildfire events and how that's impacting, in particular, farm workers there as well. So um, I don't know how much time we have left, but I just wanted to share that as well. Great, uh, maybe we can take just one last question. Yeah. Great, super. Um, thanks for being here today and speaking with us. Um, this might be a little wide ranging, so forgive me, but uh, as an uh, environmental justice activist myself, I work with a lot of, a lot of groups in, in regard to climate action, but particular interest in mass communication and building popular support so I was wondering if you could perhaps share some of your observations on the most effective methods you've observed in uh, promoting any particular climate programs or the strengths and weaknesses 
Uh, I guess more specifically, I've, I've heard in some academia recently strongly argue against using hard science, hard data um, as a tool for building support. They think it's and it alienates uh, a lot of just quote unquote normal people that they're trying to uh, to convince. Um, and maybe what what which what is effective in turn for that. And then perhaps in addition to that, if you want, um, I was just curious on your thoughts on um, uh, these people in minority groups uh, using uh, their experience to convince for a certain political argument. Uh, that is like, uh, in my experience, like ha having those share these very emotional appeals and but their body experience are very effective, but it also requires a lot of emotional labor on their part. So um, I don't know. If <laughs> no, 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 no. I everything, everything that you talk about, the heart of my book, you know, that, that conflict and collaboration, those worldviews that I mentioned, structural locations that people are coming um, from environmental justice groups believe in climate science. They believe in climate-based science from public health, COVID-19 pandemic, they, off, they have taken stances on that as well, to climate change and sustainability science. They absolutely um, believe in that. And from, from the research that I do and then my own uh, professional practice as a, a policymaker myself uh, on the water board have seen that. Um, there's no argument about there. The art, the, sort of the tension and the conflict or cleavage that may happen is what science are we going to use? What data? What metrics? Um, uh, Donatella Meadows, who's uh, a very famous sustainability science uh, a scientist, uh, she's she had a, a, a saying that really stuck with me. We we measure what we value. So nobody is in sustainability science, and nobody's arguing against uh, the science. But what people uh, are often, what are you going to measure? What are you valuing? And then if you're, you're, you're one demographic group, uh, all the scientists, all the engineers, all the modelers are coming from just one worldview, one cultural background. How is that going to uh, impact the research questions that you ask, the data you collect, and again, the corresponding solutions? My dog. Um, and then what stakeholders you, you invite and who you have rapport with? If, if, Anyone, this is a very international program, a very elite international program. People are coming from all over the world. And that's one of the draws of, of your school and your department is having that experience, that international context, that world global context. And that often doesn't happen at the local state and, and in some of these very fancy United Nations um, uh, convenings. Um, there's some dominant groups um, because of wealth and power. So uh, key individual actors are driving the agenda oftentimes. Um, so we, I, 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 I'm learning more about the international context and climate change. I'm going to participate my first time, but I, I do know the, the local state and increasingly the, uh, the federal level. And, and it's quite um, jarring sometimes to be in those spaces and who's invited. I'm quite privileged and uh, honored to be starting to be invo uh, invited to those spaces, but um, uh, seeing it um, at various policy scales really matters. So diversifying, who are the scientists? Who are the scientists interacting with? And again, building those relationships. What urban planners do, and, and dis from disaster planning to transportation, is a form of a scientific tool or scientific method that, uh, that's based on rationality. And nobody's arguing against that, but how do we make those systems and tools and logics that we use as urban planners, uh, sustainability scientists or engineers or policy scientists? Um, that are more inclusive, more representative, and uh, more uh, more understanding of the various contexts um, it, uh, that individuals uh, experience, and understand that climate change happens in larger society, in multiple groups and demographic groups. Uh, we see more questions in the chat box, but unfortunately, we're at time. So on behalf of GFAP and the Urban Planning Program in particular, I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Mendez, for your wonderful presentation. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time. And thanks also to everyone who attended today's lecture. Uh, make sure to join us again next week at the same time for our next speaker by Professor Sophie Gonick, whose talk will be on contesting dispossession, immigrants, and the struggle for housing Madrid. And I just want to do a shout out to Ariella. Uh, I went to um, MIT with her and uh, hope to connect with you soon. Thank you. Awesome.
Uh, and uh, Professor Mendez, if you have uh, 10 to 15 minutes, we just have a um, like a one on one with the PhD students. Um, sure. Great, thank you. So yeah, we'll just take a couple minutes to get the room cleared out and shut down the Zoom for everyone else. Okay, I'm gonna get some water. I'm gonna.